St. Augustine's Confessions, Book 5, Confessions 1. Accept my confessions, O Lord. They are a sacrifice offered by my tongue, for yours was the hand that fashioned it, and yours the spirit that moved it to acknowledge you. Heal all my bones and let them say, Lord, there is none like you. If a man confesses to you, he does not reveal his inmost thoughts to you as though you did not know them. For the heart may shut itself away, but it cannot hide from your sight. Man's heart may be hard, but it cannot resist the touch of your hand. Whenever you will, your mercy or your punishment can make it relent, and just as none can hide away from the sun, none can escape your burning heat. Let my soul praise you so that it may show its love, and let it make a vowel of your mercies so that for these it may praise you. No part of your creation ever ceases to resound in praise of you. Man turns his lips to you in prayer and his spirit praises you. Animals too, and lifeless things as well, praise you through the lips of all who give them thought. For our souls lean for support upon the things which you have created, so that we may be lifted up to you from our weakness and use them to help us on our way to you who made them all so wonderfully. And in you we are remade and find true strength. Confessions 2 Let the wicked go upon their way and fly from you, for they know no rest. But your eye can pierce the darkness, you can see them. All the world about them teems with beauty and they alone defile it. What harm have they been able to inflict on you? Have they been able to bring disgrace upon your rule, which reaches in its indivisible justice from the heights of heaven to the meanest things of earth? Where did they find refuge when they turned from your face and fled? What hiding place can they find where you cannot seek them out? They have fled and hidden their eyes from you, knowing that yours are on them. They are blind and do not see the God they have offended, but you are there, because you abandon no part of your creation. They have offended against your justice, and for this they have justly suffered, because they have stolen away from your gentle mercy and sinned against your law, and so they have fallen down upon your anger. Clearly, the wicked do not know that you are everywhere, but you are not bound within the limits of any place. You alone are always present, even to those who set themselves apart from you. Let them then turn back and look for you. They will find that you have not deserted your creatures as they have deserted their Creator. Let them turn back, and they will find you in their hearts, in the hearts of all who confess to you and throw themselves upon your mercy, in the hearts of all who have left the hard path and come to weep upon your breast. Gently you wipe away their tears. They weep the more, but now their tears are tears of joy, because it is not some man of flesh and blood, but you, O Lord, their Maker, who remakes them and consoles them. But where was I when I looked for you? You were there before my eyes, but I had deserted even my own self. I could not find myself, much less find you. Confessions 3 In the sight of my God I will describe the twenty-ninth year of my age. A Manichaean bishop named Faustus had recently arrived at Carthage. He was a great decoy of the devil, and many people were trapped by his charming manner of speech. This I certainly admired, but I was beginning to distinguish between mere eloquence and the real truth, which I was so eager to learn. The Manichaeans talked so much about this man Faustus that I wanted to see what scholarly fare he would lay before me, and I did not care what words he used to garnish the dish. I had already heard that he was very well versed in all the higher forms of learning, and particularly in the liberal sciences. I had read a great many scientific books which were still alive in my memory. 
When I compared them with the tedious tales of the Manichees, it seemed to me that of the two, the theories of the scientists were the more likely to be true. For their thoughts could reach far enough to form a judgment about the world around them, though they found no trace of him who is master of it. You, Lord, who are so high above us, yet look with favour on the humble, Look on the proud too, but from far off. You come close only to men who are humble at heart. The proud cannot find you, even though by dint of study they have skill to number stars and grains of sand, to measure the tracts of constellations and trace the paths of planets. The reason and understanding by which they investigate these things are gifts they have from you. By means of them, they have discovered much and foretold eclipses of the sun and moon many years before they happened. They calculated the day and the hour of the eclipse, and whether it would be total or partial, and their reckonings were found correct, because it all happened as they had predicted. They wrote down the principles which they had discovered, and their books are still read and used to forecast the year, the month, the day, and the hour of eclipses of the sun and moon, and the degree of their totality and these eclipses will take place just as they foretell. These powers are a source of wonder and astonishment to men who do not know the secrets. But the astronomers are flattered and claim the credit for themselves. They lapse into pride without respect for you, my God, and fall into shadow away from your light. But although they can predict an eclipse of the sun so far ahead, they cannot see that they themselves are already in the shadow of eclipse. This is because they ignore you and do not inquire how they come to possess the intelligence to make these researches. Even when they discover that it was you who made them, they do not submit to you so that you may preserve what you have made, nor such as their own efforts have made them do they offer themselves to you in sacrifice. Their conceit soars like a bird. Their curiosity probes the deepest secrets of nature like a fish that swims in the sea, and their lust grows fat like a beast at pasture. But they slaughter none of these. Yet if they make this sacrifice to your God, you are the consuming fire that can burn away their love for these things and recreate the men in immortal life. They do not know Christ, who is the way and the word of God, by which you created all the things which they number and count, the very men who count them, the senses by which they are aware of what they count, and the intelligence by which they count them. Your wisdom is inscrutable, but your only begotten Son was given to us to be our wisdom, our justification, and our sanctification. He was counted as one of our number, and he paid his dues to Caesar. Yet these men do not know that he is the way by which they must come down from the heights where they have set themselves and rise again with him to be with him. They do not know this way, but think themselves as high and as bright as the stars. And this is why they have fallen to earth and their senseless hearts grow benighted. Much of what they say about the created world is true, but they do not search with piety for the truth, its creator. This is why they do not find him. Or if they do find him and have the knowledge of God, they do not honour him or give thanks to him as God. They become fantastic in their notions. They who claim to be so wise attribute to themselves what is yours. And in the same perverse blindness, they try to ascribe their own qualities to you. They even attribute falsehoods to you who are the truth itself. They exchange the glory of the imperishable God for representations of perishable man, of bird and beast and reptile. They exchange your truth for a lie, reverencing and worshipping the creature in preference to the creator. All the same, I remembered many of the true things that they had said about the created world, and I saw that their calculations were borne out by mathematics the regular succession of the seasons and the visible evidence of the stars. I compared it all with the teaching of Mainz, who had written a great deal on these subjects, all of it extremely incoherent. But in his writings I could find no reasonable explanation of the solstices and the equinoxes or of eclipses and similar phenomena such as I had read about in books written by secular scientists. 
Yet I was expected to believe what he had written, although it was entirely at variance and out of keeping with the principles of mathematics and the evidence of my own eyes. Confessions 4 O Lord, God of truth, if a man is to please you, surely it is not enough that he should know facts like these. Even if he knows them all, he is not happy unless he knows you. But the man who knows you is happy, even if he knows none of these things. And the man who knows you and knows these things as well is none the happier for his knowledge of them. He is happy only because he knows you, and then only if he has knowledge of you and honours you and gives you thanks as God and does not become fantastic in his notions. A man who knows that he owns a tree and thanks you for the use he has of it, even though he does not know its exact height or the width of its spread, is better than another who measures it and counts all its branches, but neither owns it nor knows and loves its creator. In just the same way, a man who has faith in you owns all the wealth of the world. For if he clings to you, whom all things serve, though he has nothing, yet he owns them all. It would be foolish to doubt that such a man, though he may not know the track of the great bear, is altogether better than another who measures the sky and counts the stars and weighs the elements, but neglects you who allot to all things their size, their number and their weight. Confessions 5 But who asked that any manichae should write about science as well as religion, when we can learn our duty to God without a knowledge of these things? For you have told man that wisdom is fearing the Lord. Even if Mainz did not have this true wisdom, he could still have had a very good knowledge of science. But as he knew no science and yet had the effrontery to try to teach it, he could not possibly have had true wisdom. For it is sheer vanity for a man to profess his learning, even if it is well-founded, whereas it is his duty to you, O God, to confess his sins. Mainz departed from this duty. He wrote at great length on scientific subjects, only to be proved wrong by genuine scientists, thereby making perfectly clear the true nature of his insight into more abstruse matters. Because he did not want them to think lightly of him, he tried to convince his followers that the Holy Spirit, who comforts and enriches your faithful servants, was present in him personally and with full powers. Therefore, when he was shown to be wrong in what he said about the sky and the stars and the movements of the sun and the moon, it was obvious that he was guilty of sacrilegious presumption. Because although these matters are no part of religious doctrine, he was not only ignorant of the subjects which he taught, but also taught what was false, yet was demented and conceited enough to claim that his utterances were those of a divine person. Whenever I hear a brother Christian talk in such a way as to show that he is ignorant of these scientific matters and confuses one thing with another, I listen with patience to his theories and think it no harm to him that he does not know the true facts about material things, provided that he holds no beliefs unworthy of you, O Lord, who are the creator of them all. The danger lies in thinking that such knowledge is part and parcel of what he must believe to save his soul and in presuming to make obstinate declarations about things of which he knows nothing. Yet when a man first enters the cradle of the faith, charity, his mother, will show indulgence even to failings of this sort until the new man reaches perfect manhood and cannot be driven before the wind of each new doctrine. But Mainz dared to pose as teacher, sole authority, guide, and leader of all whom he could convince of his theories, leading his followers to believe that they were following no ordinary man but your Holy Spirit. Surely then, once he had been detected in error, everyone would agree that he was a madman, and that his claims were repugnant and should be entirely rejected. All the same, I was not yet entirely satisfied that his writings might not contain a plausible explanation of the variations in the length of the day and the night, the alternation of night and day, eclipses, and the other phenomena of which I had read elsewhere. If his theories were admissible, 
I should have been undecided whether he or the scientists were right, but I might have chosen to accept his authority because of his reputed sanctity. Confession 6 For almost the whole of those nine years, during which my mind was unsettled and I was an aspirant of the Manichees, I awaited the coming of this man Faustus with the keenest expectation. Other members of the sect whom I happened to meet were unable to answer the questions I raised upon these subjects, for they assured me that once Faustus had arrived, I had only to discuss them with him, and he would have no difficulty in giving me a clear explanation of my queries, and any other more difficult problems which I might put forward. At last he arrived. I found him a man of agreeable personality, with a pleasant manner of speech, who patted off the usual Manichaean arguments with a great deal more than the usual charm. But my thirst was not to be satisfied in this way, however precious the cup and however exquisite the man who served it. My ears were already ringing with these tales, and they seemed to me none the better for being better expressed, nor true simply because they were eloquently told. Neither did I think that a pleasant face and a gifted tongue were proof of a wise mind. Those who had given me such assurances about him must have been poor judges. They thought him wise and thoughtful simply because they were charmed by his manner of speech. I have known men of another sort who look on truth with suspicion and are unwilling to accept it if it is presented in fine rounded phrases. But in your wonderful secret way, my God, you had already taught me that a statement is not necessarily true because it is wrapped in fine language or false because it is awkwardly expressed. I believe that it was you who taught me this because it is the truth and there is no other teacher of the truth besides yourself, no matter how or where it comes to light. You had already taught me this lesson and the converse truth, that an assertion is not necessarily true because it is badly expressed or false because it is finely spoken. I had learned that wisdom and folly are like different kinds of food. Some are wholesome and others are not, but both can be served equally well on the finest china dish or the meanest earthenware. In just the same way, wisdom and folly can be clothed alike in plain words or the finest flowers of speech. My long and eager expectation of Faustus's arrival was amply rewarded by the way in which he set about the task of disputation and the goodwill that he showed. The ease with which he found the right words to clothe his thoughts delighted me, and I was not the only one to applaud it, though perhaps I did so more than most. But I found it tiresome, when so many people assembled to hear him, not to be allowed to approach him with my difficulties and lay them before him in the friendly give and take of conversation. As soon as the opportunity arose, I and some of my friends claimed his attention at a time when a private discussion would not be inappropriate. I mentioned some of my doubts, but soon discovered that except for a rudimentary knowledge of literature, he had no claims to scholarship. He had read some of Cicero's speeches, one or two books of Seneca, some poetry and such books as had been written in good Latin by members of his sect. Besides his daily practice as a speaker, this reading was the basis of his eloquence, which derived extra charm and plausibility from his attractive personality and his ability to make good use of his mental powers. O oh Lord my God, is this not the truth as I remember it? You are the judge of my conscience, and my heart and my memory lie open before you. The secret hand of your providence guided me then, and you set my abject errors before my eyes, so that I might see them and detest them. Confession 7 as soon as it became clear to me that Faustus was quite uninformed about the subjects in which I had expected him to be an expert, I began to lose hope that he could lift the veil and resolve the problems which perplexed me. Of course, despite his ignorance of these matters, he might still have been a truly pious man, provided he were not a manichae. 
Manichaean books are full of the most tedious fictions about the sky and the stars, the sun and the moon. I badly wanted Faustus to compare these with the mathematical calculations which I had studied in other books, so that I might judge whether the Manichaean theories were more likely to be true or at least equally probable, but I now began to realise that he could not give me a detailed explanation. When I suggested that we should consider these problems and discuss them together, he was certainly modest enough not to undertake the task. He knew that he did not know the answers to my questions and was not ashamed to admit it, for unlike many other talkative people whom I have had to endure, he would not try to teach me a lesson when he had nothing to say. He had a heart, and though his approach to you was mistaken, he was not without discretion. He was not entirely unaware of his limitations and did not want to enter rashly into an argument which might force him into a position which he could not possibly maintain and from which he could not easily withdraw. I liked him all the better for this, because modesty and candour are finer equipment for the mind than scientific knowledge of the kind that I wished to possess. I found that his attitude towards all the more difficult and abstruse questions was the same. The keen interest which I had had in Manichaean doctrines was checked by this experience, and my confidence in the other teachers of the sect was further diminished when I saw that Faustus, of whom they spoke so much, was obviously unable to settle the numerous problems which troubled me. His enthusiasm for literature, which I was then teaching to students at Carthage, often brought us together, and I set out to read with him either the books which he knew by repute and was eager to study, or such works as I thought suitable for a man of his intelligence. But once I had come to know him well, all my endeavours to make progress in the sect, as I had intended, were abandoned. I did not cut myself off entirely from the Manichees, but as I could find nothing better than the beliefs which I had stumbled upon more or less by chance, I decided to be content with them for the time being, unless something preferable clearly presented itself to me. So it was, that unwittingly and without intent, Faustus, who had been a deadly snare to many, now began to release me from the trap in which I had been caught. For in the mystery of your providence, my God, your guiding hand did not desert me. Night and day, my mother poured out her tears to you and offered her heart blood in sacrifice for me, and in the most wonderful way you guided me. It was you who guided me, my God. For man's feet to stand firm if the Lord is with him to prosper his journey. What else can save us but your hand, remaking what you have made? Confessions 8 It was then, by your guidance, that I was persuaded to go to Rome and teach there the subjects which I taught at Carthage. I will not omit to confess to you how I was persuaded to do this, because even in matters like these we need to reflect upon your sublime secrets and the mercy which you are always ready to show to us. It was not because I could earn higher fees and greater honours that I wanted to go to Rome, though these were the rewards promised to me by my friends who urged me to go. Naturally, these considerations influenced me, but the most important reason, and almost the only one, was that I had heard that the behaviour of young students at Rome was quieter. Discipline was stricter, and they were not permitted to rush insolently and just as they pleased into the lecture rooms of teachers who were not their own masters. In fact, they were not admitted at all without the master's permission. At Carthage, on the other hand, the students are beyond control and their behaviour is disgraceful. They come blustering into the lecture rooms like a troop of maniacs and upset the orderly arrangements which the master has made in the interest of his pupils. Their recklessness is unbelievable and they often commit outrages which ought to be punished by law were it not their custom protects them. Nevertheless, it is a custom which only proves their plight the more grievous because it supposedly sanctions behaviour which your eternal law will never allow. They think that they do these things with impunity, but the very blindness with which they do them is punishment in itself, and they suffer far more harm than they inflict. As a student, I had refused 
to take part in this behaviour, but as a teacher I was obliged to endure it in others. This was why I was glad to go to a place where, by all accounts, such disturbances did not occur. But it was to save my soul that you obliged me to go and live elsewhere, you who are my only refuge, all that is left me in this world of living men. You applied the spur that would drive me away from Carthage and offered me enticements that would draw me to Rome, and for your purpose you made use of men whose hearts were set upon this life of death, some acting like madmen, others promising me vain rewards. In secret you were using my own perversity and theirs to set my feet upon the right course. For those who upset my leisure were blind in their shameless violence, and those who tempted me to go elsewhere knew only the taste of worldly things. As for myself, life at Carthage was a real misery and I loathed it, but the happiness I hoped to find at Rome was not real happiness. You knew, O oh God, why it was that I left one city and went to the other. But you did not make the reason clear either to me or to my mother. She wept bitterly to see me go and followed me to the water's edge, clinging to me with all her strength in the hope that I would either come home or take her with me. I deceived her with the excuse that I had a friend whom I did not want to leave until the wind rose and his ship could sail. It was a lie told to my own mother, and to such a mother too. But you did not punish me for it, because you forgave me this sin, also when in your mercy you kept me safe from the waters of the sea, laden though I was with detestable impurities, and preserved me to receive the water of your grace. This was the water that would wash me clean and halt the flood of tears with which my mother daily watered the ground as she bowed her head, praying to you for me. But she would not go home without me, and it was all I could do to persuade her to stay that night in a shrine dedicated to St. Cyprian, not far from the ship. During the night, secretly, I sailed away, leaving her alone to her tears and her prayers. And what did she beg of you, my God, with all those tears, if not that you would prevent me from sailing? But you did not do as she asked you then. Instead, in the depth of your wisdom, you granted the wish that was closest to her heart. You did with me what she had always asked you to do. The wind blew and filled our sails, and the shore disappeared from sight. The next morning she was wild with grief, pouring her sighs and sorrows in your ear, because she thought you had not listened to her prayer. But you were letting my own desires carry me away on a journey that was to put an end to those same desires, and you used her too jealous love for her son as a scourge of sorrow for her just punishment. For as mothers do, and far more than most, she loved to have me with her, and she did not know what joys you had in store for her because of my departure. It was because she did not know this that she wept and wailed, and the torments which she suffered were proof that she had inherited the legacy of Eve, seeking in sorrow what with sorrow she had brought into the world. But at last she ceased upbraiding me for my deceit and my cruelty, and turned again to you to offer her prayers for me. She went back to her house, and I went on to Rome. Confessions 9 At Rome I was at once struck down by illness, which all but carried me off to hell loaded with all the evil that I had committed against you, against myself and against other men, a host of grave offences over and above the bond of original sin by which we all have died with Adam. You had not yet forgiven me any of these sins in Christ, nor on his cross had he dissolved the enmity which my sins had earned me in your sight. How could he dissolve it on the cross if he were a mere phantom, as I believed? In so far, then, as I thought the death of his body unreal, the death of my own soul was real. And the life of my soul, because it doubted his death, was as false as the death of his flesh was true. My fever rose. I came close to dying, close to losing my soul. For if I left this life, where else would I go but to the fiery torments which my deeds deserved in the justice of your law? 
My mother did not know that I was ill, yet far away she continued to pray for me. But you are present everywhere. Where she was, you listened to her prayers, and where I was, you had mercy on me, so that I regained my bodily health, though my blasphemous heart was still diseased. For despite my great danger, I had no desire to be baptised. As a boy, I had been better, for I had appealed to my mother's piety and begged her to let me be baptised, as I have already recalled in these confessions. But I had grown up and grown more vicious with the years. I was a fool who laughed at the cure which you prescribed when you saved me in my state of sin, from twofold death, the death of the body and the death of the soul. If I had died in that state, my mother's heart would never have recovered from the blow. Words cannot describe how dearly she loved me, or how much greater was the anxiety she suffered for my spiritual birth than the physical pain she had endured in bringing me into the world. I cannot see how she could ever have recovered if I had died in that condition, for my death would have pierced the very heart of her love. And what would have become of all the fervent prayers which she offered so often and without fail? They would have come to you, nowhere but to you. But would you, O God of mercy, have despised the contrite and humble heart of that chaste and gentle widow, so ready to give alms, so full of humble reverence for your saints, who never let a day go by unless she had brought an offering to your altar, and never failed to come to your church twice every day, each morning and night, not to listen to empty tales and old wives' gossip, but so that she might hear the preaching of your word and you might listen to her prayers. Could you deny your help to her when it was by your grace that she was what she was, or despise her tears when she asked not for gold or silver or any fleeting, short-lived favour, but that the soul of her son might be saved? Never would you have done this, O Lord. No, you were there to hear her prayer and do all in due order as you had determined it was to be done. It could not be that you would have deceived her in the visions you sent her and the answers you gave to her prayers, both those that I have recorded and the others which I have not set down. All these signs she cherished in her faithful heart, and in her ceaseless prayers she laid them before you as though they were pledges signed by your hand. For since your mercy endures for ever, by your promises you deign to become a debtor to those whom you release from every debt. Confessions 10 So it was that you healed my sickness. To the son of your servant you restored the health of his body so that he might live to receive from you another far better and more certain kind of health. In Rome I did not part company with those would-be saints who were such frauds both to themselves and to others. I associated not only with aspirants, one of whom was my host during my illness and convalescence, but also with those whom they call the elect. I still thought that it is not we who sin, but some other nature that sins within us. It flattered my pride to think that I incurred no guilt, and when I did wrong not to confess it, so that you might bring healing to a soul that had sinned against you. I preferred to excuse myself and blame this unknown thing which was in me, but was not part of me. The truth, of course, was that it was all my own self and my own impiety that divided me against myself. My sin was all the more incurable because I did not think myself a sinner. It was abominable wickedness to prefer to defeat your ends and lose my soul rather than submit to you and gain salvation. You had not yet set a guard on my mouth, posted a sentry before my lips, that my heart might not turn towards thoughts of evil to cover sins with smooth names and take part with the wrongdoers. This was why I still associated with the elect of the Manichees. All the same, I had no hope of profit from their false doctrines, and by now I was also becoming indifferent and inattentive to the theories with which I had resolved to be content unless I could find something better. I began to think that the philosophers known as academics were wiser than the rest, 
because they held that everything was a matter of doubt and asserted that man can know nothing for certain. This is the common belief about their teaching, and it seemed evident to me that it was what they thought, but I did not yet understand what they really meant. At the same time, I did not scruple to discourage my host from placing too much confidence, as I saw that he did, in the tales which filled the pages of the Manichaean books. Nevertheless, I remained on more familiar terms with the Manichaeans than with others who did not share their heresy. I no longer advocated their cause with my old enthusiasm, but many of them were to be found in Rome, living unobtrusively, and the friendship made me slow to seek another, especially since I had lost hope of being able to find the truth in your church, O Lord of heaven and earth, creator of all things visible and invisible. The Manichees had turned me away from it. At the same time, I thought it outrageous to believe that you had the shape of a human body and were limited within the dimensions of limbs like our own. When I tried to think of my God, I could think of him only as a bodily substance, because I could not conceive of the existence of anything else. This was the principle and almost the only cause of the error from which I could not escape. For the same reason, I believe that evil too was some similar kind of substance, a shapeless, hideous mass, which might be solid, in which case the Manichees called it earth, or fine and rarefied like air. This they imagine as a kind of evil mind filtering through the substance they call earth. And because such little piety as I had compelled me to believe, that God who is good could not have created an evil nature, I imagined that there were two antagonistic masses, both of which were infinite, yet the evil in a lesser and the good in a greater degree. All my other sacrilegious beliefs were the outcome of this first fatal mistake. For when I tried to fall back upon the Catholic faith, my mind recoiled because the Catholic faith was not what I supposed it to be. My theories forced me to admit that you were finite in one point only, insofar as the mass of evil was able to oppose you. But, O oh my God, whose mercies I now aver, if I believed that you were infinite in all other ways, I thought that this was a more pious belief than to suppose that you were limited in each and every way by the outlines of a human body. And it seemed to me better to believe that you had created no evil than to suppose that evil, such as I imagined it to be, had its origin in you. For ignorant as I was, I thought of evil not simply as some vague substance, but as an actual bodily substance, and this was because I could not conceive of mind except as a rarefied body somehow diffused in space. I also thought of our Saviour, your only Son, as somehow extended or projected for our salvation from the mass of your transplendent body, and I was so convinced of this that I could believe nothing about him except such futile dreams as I could picture to myself. I did not believe that a nature such as his could have taken birth from the Virgin Mary unless it were mingled with her flesh. And if it were such as I imagined it to be, I could not see how it could be mingled with her flesh without being defiled. So I dared not believe in his incarnation, for fear that I should be compelled to believe that the flesh had defiled him. Those who have the gifts of your Holy Spirit will laugh at me, in all kindness and charity, if they read of this confusion in my mind. But this was the man that I was. Confessions 11 Besides this, I thought that there could be no answer to the objections raised by the Manichees against the Scriptures. For there were times when I had a genuine wish to discuss these points, one by one, with someone who had a really profound knowledge of Scripture, so that I might hear his views on them. Even before I left Carthage, I had listened to the speeches of a man named Elpidius, who used to join in open controversy with the Manichees and I had been impressed when he put forward arguments from Scripture, which were not easy to demolish. I thought that the Manichees' answer was weak, and in fact they were chary of giving it in public, and only mentioned it in private to adherents of the sect. 
They claimed that the books of the New Testament had been tampered with by unnamed persons who wished to impose the Jewish law upon the Christian faith, but they could produce no uncorrupted copies. But it was principally the idea of the two masses of good and evil that held me fast and stifled me, for I was unable to conceive of any but material realities. Under the weight of these two masses I gasped for the pure, clear air of your truth, but I could draw no breath of it. Confessions 12 I began actively to set about the business of teaching literature and public speaking, which was the purpose for which I had come to Rome. At first I taught in my house, where I collected a number of pupils who had heard of me, and through them my reputation began to grow. But I now realised that there were difficulties in Rome with which I had not had to contend in Africa. True enough, I found that there was no rioting by young hooligans, but I was told that at any moment a number of students would plot together to avoid paying their master his fees and would transfer in a body to another. They were quite unscrupulous and justice meant nothing to them compared with the love of money. There was hatred for them in my heart, and it was not unselfish hatred, for I supposed that I hated them more for what I should have to suffer from them than for the wrong they might do to any teacher. All the same, students like these are utterly dishonest. They break their troth with you by setting their hearts on fleeting temporal delusions and tainted money which defiles the hands that grasp it, and by clinging to a world which they can never hold. And all the while they turn their backs on you who are always present, calling them back and ready to pardon man's adulterous soul when it returns to you. For their warped and crooked minds I still hate students like these. But I love them too, hoping to teach them to mend their ways, so that they may learn to love their studies more than money, and love you, their God, still more. For you are the truth, the source of good that does not fail, and the peace of purest innocence. But in those days I was readier to dislike them for fear of the harm they might cause me than to hope that they would become good for your sake. Confessions 13 So when the prefect of Rome received a request from Milan to find a teacher of literature and elocution for the city, with the promise that travelling expenses would be charged to public funds, I applied for the appointment, armed with recommendations from my friends who are so fuddled with the Manichaean rigmarole. This journey was to mean the end of my association with them, though none of us knew it at the time. Eventually, Symmachus, who was then prefect, set me a test to satisfy himself of my abilities and sent me to Milan. In Milan, I found your devoted servant, the Bishop Ambrose, who was known throughout the world as a man whom there were few to equal in goodness. At that time, his gifted tongue never tired of dispensing the richness of your corn, the joy of your oil, and the sober intoxication of your wine. Unknown to me, it was you who led me to him, so that I might knowingly be led by him to you. This man of God received me like a father, and as bishop told me how glad he was that I had come. My heart warmed to him, not at first as a teacher of the truth, which I had quite despaired of finding in your church, but simply as a man who showed me kindness. I listened attentively when he preached to the people, though not with the proper intention. For my purpose was to judge for myself whether the reports of his powers as a speaker were accurate, or whether eloquence flowed from him more or less readily than I had been told. So while I paid the closest attention to the words he used, I was quite uninterested in the subject matter and was even contemptuous of it. I was delighted with his charming delivery, but although he was a more learned speaker than Faustus, he had not the same soothing and gratifying manner. I am speaking only of his style. For as to content, there could be no comparison between the two. 
Faustus had lost his way among the fallacies of Manichaeism, while Ambrose most surely taught the doctrine of salvation. But your mercy is unknown to sinners such as I was then, though step by step, unwittingly, I was coming closer to it. Confessions 14 For although I did not trouble to take what Ambrose said to heart, but only to listen to the manner in which he said it, this being the only paltry interest that remained to me now that I had lost hope that man could find the path that led to you, nevertheless his meaning, which I tried to ignore, found its way into my mind, together with his words, which I admired so much. I could not keep the two apart, and while I was all ears to seize upon his eloquence, I also began to sense the truth of what he said, though only gradually. First of all, it struck me that it was, after all, possible to vindicate his arguments. I began to believe that the Catholic faith, which I had thought impossible to defend against the objections of the Manichees, might fairly be maintained, especially since I had heard one passage after another in the Old Testament figuratively explained. These passages had been death to me when I took them literally, but once I had heard them explained in their spiritual meaning, I began to blame myself for my despair, at least in so far as it had led me to suppose that it was quite impossible to counter people who hated and derided the law and the prophets. But I did not feel that I ought to follow the Catholic path simply because it too had its learned men, ready to vouch for it and never at a loss for sound arguments in answer to objections. On the other hand, I did not think that my own beliefs should be condemned simply because an equally good case could be made out for either side. For I thought the Catholic side unbeaten, but still not victorious. Next, I tried my utmost to find some certain proof which would convict the Manichees of falsehood. If I had been able to conceive of a spiritual substance, all their inventions would at once have been disproved and rejected from my mind. But this I could not do. However, the more I thought about the material world and the whole of nature, as far as we can be aware of it through our bodily senses, and the more I took stock of the various theories, the more I began to think that the opinions of the majority of the philosophers were most likely to be true. So treating everything as a matter of doubt, as the academics are generally supposed to do, and hovering between one doctrine and another, I made up my mind at least to leave the Manichees. For while I was in this state of indecision, I did not think it right to remain in the sect now that I found the theories of some of the philosophers preferable. Nevertheless, I utterly refused to entrust the healing of the maladies of my soul to these philosophers, because they ignored the saving name of Christ. I therefore decided to remain a catechumen in the Catholic Church, which was what my parents wanted at least until I could clearly see a light to guide my steps. <laughs>